the British people to do so safely. Scenes like this caused concern at the weekend. Last week, crowds crammed onto England Bournemouth Beach, Ireland. seemingly ignoring social distancing. Today, Ministers could only hope they've got this right. Over the past couple of weeks, our hometown of London has started to slowly resemble pieces of its former self. But even with restaurants, cafes, bars and attractions attempting a return to normal, is it actually worth a trip to this fantastic city post-lockdown? In this video, I want to paint a full picture of what it's actually like trying to be a tourist in London. I'll be giving you our experiences of being out and about, some of the current do's and don'ts, and advice on what activities lend themselves best to this new way of living. Ultimately, what are all the new changes for visiting the capital in 2020 and beyond? This is Suitcase Monkey, exploring London with both new eyes and a mask. So let's talk about wearing masks first off. Currently in England, face masks must be worn on all public transport, inside shops and supermarkets, so not outside in the open air. The exception to all of this is children under the age of 11 and those with certain physical or mental impairments. For public transport, I would say around 80% of people have been wearing a face mask. Oh, and while we're on the subject, in case there's any confusion, wearing a face mask means both covering your mouth and your nose. I've seen countless people who think this is sufficient. Wearing a mask with your nose poking over the top is like wearing your pants with your sausage poking over the top. Now, on the times I've used public transport, I've actually felt pretty safe. Initially, social distancing was two meters, but now it's classified as one meter plus. I have to use various trains to get to work, and so far, I've never felt overwhelmed by people. At its best, this was the Victoria Line at 9.30 in the morning, on a weekday. I was literally the only person on the platform. At its worst, there will definitely be times where people will enter your one meter space, so have a think if that's okay with you. But personally, I've never experienced it to be so packed or uncomfortable. The advice is to, where possible, walk or use one of London's rental bikes such as Santander, Lime or Uber's Jump. Everything on the tube network is automated so you never have to actually touch anything. The barriers, the train doors, trying not to hold the handrails is probably the hardest thing of all, but it does add a layer of intensity to the popular pastime of underground surfing. So, you know, it's the little things. Dining out in London has also changed quite a bit. For one, pubs and restaurants will now require you to provide your name and contact details on arrival. This is so that you're contactable if someone tests positive who's visited the same establishment as yourself and you'll need to self-isolate for two weeks if that happens. Most places have just had the waiter come over and ask us to write down our details, but full marks goes to Banana Tree in Soho. On arrival, we were informed to join their Wi-Fi network, and this immediately popped up a screen where we gave our information without needing to share a pen. Then our paper placemats even had a QR code, which we just pointed our cameras to, and this took us online for their menu. This was a great way of using technology and meant that it was just one less thing we needed to handle. London specifically has been ahead of most places for years in terms of contactless payments. But now it's actually gone even further. Previously, contactless debit or credit card payments were limited to £30, but they've recently been raised to £45. Google and Apple Pay, on the other hand, don't have any such limits unless the retailer sets one, so this is a really good alternative. You can also use your phone as payment for using public transport, so it helps there also. In addition, cash is often outright refused in some places, so keep that in mind when travelling. A few of you actually reached out asking how safe the streets are in general at the moment, for the most part, things have generally been as safe as they normally are in any big city. There have been a handful of cases around London that have turned violent, but this has been the exception. The Black Lives Matter protests were peaceful, with only small pockets of individuals causing any issues, but nothing like I've seen in other parts of the world. So now let's cover some of the best things to do in London with all the restrictions in place, then we'll go on to some of the more trickier activities afterwards. 
The general consensus is that we are much more safe in outside environments where there is obviously more ventilation. This relates really well to visiting London. As I mentioned in my five days in London travel guide, the city is perfect for exploring on foot and so lends itself really well. And since there are less people around, at least for a while, I would say that outdoor exploration is the first thing you should focus your time on. Walking around the city, Tower Bridge, St. Catherine's Docks, a walk along the Thames, the South Bank, St. Paul's Cathedral, London's parks, which I'll cover more in a minute, Buckingham Palace, Piccadilly Circus, Trafalgar Square, Covent Garden, Camden, Hampstead Heath, all of these places are beautiful and should be bumped up your to-do list if they weren't already. From the perspective of wandering around on foot, these places will be hardly impact compared to normal. And they are probably even more enhanced by the lack of people getting in your way when you take a selfie. Although I do think the days of getting people to take your picture for you are probably gone, so selfie sticks at the ready. When it is a nice day, visiting London's parks is regularly on our own to-do list. St James Park and Regent's Park are probably my two favourites as they're both incredibly picturesque and we've had a great time in both since lockdown ended. One afternoon, for example, we enjoyed a really nice walk from Camden Market, following a bite to eat, then a walk along the canal towards Regent's Park. We also stumbled across this beautiful church along the way, which had an adjacent coffee hut. We grabbed a drink, our own bench, and felt normal for the first time in ages. The next thing I think that lends itself to this current London is visiting a local food market. This is probably what we spent most of our initial time doing when the full lockdown ended. In recent weeks, we've visited Borough Market, Greenwich Market, Camden Market, and Spitalfields, all of which were a great few hours. The first time we visited Borough Market, we actually had to queue for about 15 minutes before we could get in. This limiting of people meant things never felt too crowded once we got inside. We were encouraged to buy food and then move on after purchase to eat away from the market to make room for others. There were no sit down seats inside the market, but the Thames is only a minute away, so I'd advise walking there where you'll easily find a seat and a nice view. If you plan to venture a bit outside of central London, Greenwich is always a lovely visit as covered in my five days in London video. Greenwich Market in particular was decorated really nice and although being the smallest market mentioned here, there was ample seating space either in front of the Cutty Sark or in Greenwich Park itself, which is massive. Spitalfields is probably the best undercover market. It's a pretty good size and has some great independent shops and retail stalls there as well. Camden Market is also similar, but is a great outdoor space with tons of energy. While not a market, Covent Garden is also a really nice area for lunch. With lots of cafes in the surrounding area, they have laid out this outside seating so anyone can just grab a chair and relax. London's museums are a great way to spend an afternoon and in terms of being indoors, are probably the most spacious rooms you'll find yourselves. Currently to control capacity, most will require you to pre-book ahead of time. Now when I went online to book, the next available slot was up to two weeks away, so plan ahead if there's something particular you want to visit. I intend on doing a full guide on London museums in future, so do keep an eye out for that, but in a nutshell, my favourites are the Natural History Museum, the British Museum and the London Museum. Most museums are currently expected to open by around the end of summer. It's worth noting that if you book online, although you can book for free, there is the option to provide a donation at the time of booking to help support these important institutions. And that's actually one thing I found really interesting. Normally, although I have of course donated to museums and I do tip the waiter, I do so more because I'm supposed to. But for the first time in forever, I actually want to tip the waiter. I want to donate more money than usual to the museum since it's needed and appreciated more than ever. I've also found that London is feeling more personal and warm than ever. Typically in London, if you make small talk, everyone involved will want to die from embarrassment and awkwardness. But I've gotten into so many more random conversations with strangers and the city just feels more welcoming than ever. And that's of course mostly because for three months we were all locked inside our homes and now it's this thing that we've all gone through and we all share in common. The thing we've avoided most is just going to bars and pubs. The nightmare pictures in Soho from the first day they opened seems to have been a worst case scenario as lots of people just went crazy for opening day. Ultimately though, alcohol and social distancing don't really lend themselves to one another, so we've just avoided it. 
Generally now you won't be ordering at the bar, all drinks are table service and will actually be brought over to you, which personally to me sounds like something I hope continues long after all this is over. We were actually wandering around Soho on a Sunday evening a couple of weeks after bars reopened and everything seemed pretty calm. So here's the big question. If you have a holiday that's already booked, is London still worth the trip? Well, I would say if you're happy with some of the compromises mentioned here, pre-booking the odd thing, doing a bit of planning to check reduced opening hours, waiting outside to get into a shop, or just generally being flexible, then you can still absolutely have a great and relatively safe time in London. It will certainly be quieter than what it would have been normally, but there will still be a bit of uncertainty during your time here. Definitely just be prepared for the odd thing to be closed. At the time of editing, the London Eye and the Harry Potter studios are still closed. All indoor theatres are obviously going to be closed for a long time. The Tower of London is open, but only for half of the week at present. And lots of the museums I mentioned have reduced hours with some exhibitions or areas entirely closed. Unless there's a resurgence of cases, this will obviously get better as time goes on, but who knows how long this will take. I think if you're thinking of booking a new trip to London, then obviously keep up to date with any changes that happen. There have been a few areas in the UK that have gone into a local quarantine, and that may well happen to London at some point. Then there's the potential cancellation fees and all the stuff that goes with that. For what it's worth, I found Booking.com, who I usually use, to be pretty flexible in terms of cancellations for our own holidays. I'll leave a London hotels link in the description below, which supports the channel at no extra cost to you if you click it and book through there. But overall, I think as long as it's deemed safe and you follow the tips mentioned here, this city still has heaps of amazing things to offer. A London holiday consisting of taking in architecture and history, sampling some of the best, most varied food in the world, exploring its numerous parks, food markets, museums and streets sounds like a pretty good way to spend your time. As long as it can be done safely. I plan on making a follow-up video where I go through fascinating London facts and quirky stories that really bring the city alive, so please subscribe if you haven't already, and check the bell icon to be notified whenever that drops. Follow us outside of YouTube also, as I've been posting thoughts and videos on our days out in London as they happen. And if you have any questions or thoughts about any of this, do let us know in the comments below. When do you plan on visiting London, if at all? Thanks for watching, Suitcase Monkey.